What would you suggest to do for heavy heartbeats? Not fast, just heavy. It can go on for me for days and weeks and then just disappear and reappear out of nowhere. Okay, so a heavy heartbeat or otherwise known as a palpitation where it feels like boom, they're just really big in your chest. There's a thing to consider. So a, a picture that I often find myself drawing, I'll try to draw it here for you guys. If you think about your heart, it's, a, it's basically a pump, right? So you got your heart anatomically correct, but it's a pump. So it's got this left, left ventricle that's pumping blood out, right? So as it pumps out, each pump, it should just be moving through here, no problem. Anybody who's ever taken like a big jug of water and tipped it upside down knows that it's going to glug you know, you see the big air bubbles come out when you're trying to dump it out of that uh, out of that jug, right? So why does that happen? So as soon as you take a big vessel or a big tube with a large diameter and try to make it go through a smaller hole, a smaller diameter, then we're going to get what's called what's turbulence. So just like you'd see in a river at the river bend where the river swirls, it creates turbulence. So the same thing happens here. So if I start to get areas where that lumen is compressed, Okay, where the wherever the vessel is is compressed. As I'm trying to push through here, I'm going to get this little swirl of blood back. And as as this creates a back pressure or retrograde flow in the system, it's going to make the valve in my atria. This is a terrible drawing, but the valve in my atria that opens up to let the blood flow after the heartbeat, it snaps back shut and the blood hits against the leaflet. So they kind of go like this where they go. They, they're like this, the heart pumps, and then they snap shut, and then the blood hits against them. And that's like the audible part of your heart sound that we hear. So when we have a restriction in the flow at some point in the, anywhere in the system, but if it comes back and you feel it in your chest, the likelihood is that you're feeling it kind of give you that turbulence back against your heart. So some people will really notice this, for example, uh, after eating where their stomach's full, it's kind of compressing against everything. It may make it harder to push blood through the abdominal aorta, and they may find that they feel their heartbeat heavy, right? You may find some people will notice this uh, if there's turbulence because you're having like a headache and you feel the heartbeats in your head because you get constriction in the blood vessels in your head. Um, so the simple way to think about it is whenever we have this is a generalization, but whenever we have something where we have a big tube and we shift it to a smaller tube, then we're going to have turbulence and we're going to feel that retrograde flow kind of go back into the, the next area. So sometimes you'll feel um, like I notice this with my kids. If I've eaten and then my five, soon to be six tomorrow, when she sits on my stomach, I can feel my heartbeats in my stomach where it's having a hard time pushing through the abdominal aorta, right? Or um, like if you're laying funny, you might feel like a pulse in your head or if you're if your arms cocked over and you're you know You're restricting a blood vessel You might feel it in your fingertips or you might feel it like up in your arm So all of those are moments where you, there's a high likelihood that we're looking at turbulence in the flow the other place that people will notice it is if we have just like a big adrenaline rush and in that big adrenaline rush where you feel your heart beating really heavy, it can be because of the contractility of the heart as well. So when we see that the heart is just beating harder, right, the, the inotropic value of the heart is more, um, then we can feel that. So these can also be medically induced. So things like evabradine, um, you know, to some degree, midodrine, like volume expanders can cause you to feel some of those heavier beats as well. Cool. Um, and they come and go maybe based on how that vascular system is being um, manipulated at any time. Sometimes it's the food you eat, can make you make it a little harder to digest. Sometimes it's positions you're in, sometimes it's stressors, um, but they can they can all be on the list. And a lot of people will notice them also more laying on their left side because your heart's closer to the chest wall on the left side. Okay. All right. Ms. Bradford says, where does shortness of breath or air hunger come from if oxygen levels seem fine? So the circulating levels of oxygen that we have 
can not necessarily indicate like to what degree we feel like we need air. A lot of a lot of our respiration rate is actually driven by CO2 levels. And a lot of that is done by sensors in the medulla, in the brainstem. We also have them in the lungs when we get feedback from the lungs. And we also have them in the arterial system. Barrow's receptors have sensors for oxygen, CO2, and glucose, which is kind of cool. And then we sample that into the medulla. So what we want to pay attention to is if it's a perception of shortness of breath and the actual breathing is okay, or is it where our breathing is becoming labored or difficult or it feels like we're not able to get a full breath in? Or we can have mechanical obstruction of the ribs where we're not able to mechanically expand the lungs. So people will notice that when we're in kind of these more kyphotic positions where we're tilted forward or if the lumbar curve is non-existent. So if our, the, our lower back is rounded because it can make it harder for the diaphragm to pull and expand the lungs. So if you try that right now, one thing you can look at just to get a sense of it is if you slump forward like that and try to take a big deep breath through your mouth, you'll notice that there's like a lot of muscles that kind of get stuck at the end of that. It's not as good as if you stick your belly out and take a big deep breath. You'll notice that you get a lot more expansion and your ribs won't necessarily even move as much. It happens from the, the mechanical advantage of your diaphragm. So those are mechanical reasons that it can happen. It can happen because we get changes in CO2 and oxygen levels at the level of the brainstem. CO2 levels can be a big one, okay? And if those CO2 levels get low, then we can start to feel like our breathing gets more labored uh, and we might start to breathe a little more shallow and a little more rapidly. And then, um, so those are things to consider as well. And then sometimes just the failure of the, the central respiratory generator or the, the feedback from different areas in the brainstem, if it's errored, then we can start to get changes in the patterns of breathing. So the actual, like the waveforms of those patterns change. And a lot of people that have um, other autonomic findings will notice this as well. So things that are stressors, things that create overwhelm, doesn't matter, they can be external or internal, can start to yield those types of problems with our breathing.